Evening. I am Ralph Semmel, director of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. I am thrilled to be able to announce the successful conclusion of NASA's double asteroid redirection test, the world's first planetary defense test mission. For the first time, humanity has demonstrated the ability to autonomously target and alter the orbit of a celestial object. The impact of DART into the asteroid Dimorphos was confirmed at 7.14 p.m. Eastern Time when the DART Mission Operations Center here at APL lost signal with the spacecraft. Now, normally, losing signal from a spacecraft is a very bad thing, but in this case, it was the ideal outcome. During the next half hour, we will get a sense of what it was like in the control room as we hear from some of the team members who were there for the final approach and impact of the DART spacecraft. I want to thank NASA for challenging us with this problem and entrusting us with the mission. DART has now joined a long list of APL firsts in space. First photos of Earth from space, creation of satellite navigation with the transit system, the incredible New Horizons flyby of Pluto, and the record-setting Parker Solar Probe that has touched the sun. We can now add to this list DART, our world's first planetary defense test mission. On behalf of the Applied Physics Laboratory, congratulations to the DART team and to NASA on this historic accomplishment and first demonstration of a game-changing planetary defense capability. Go DART! Thank you, Thank you Director Semmel. <clears throat> and again, welcome to the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, where NASA's DART mission has just made history. I'm Josh Handel with NASA's Office of Communications. Earlier, we saw incredible live coverage of DART's terminal approach with its target asteroid in near real time for humanity's first ever test for planetary defense. Let's take a look at that instant replay and that incredible footage. Wow. So here you can see Didymos and Dimorphos. The spacecraft is autonomously navigating itself. It is precision locked on the asteroid moonlet, cruising in at a speed of 4,000 miles per second. And now you can see Dimorphos slowly filling the screen. We've never seen this object before. Bullseye. We also have incredible high-resolution imagery from DART's Draco camera, which we are now able to show. Here's the asteroid system. Dimorphos filling the field of view. Incredible surface detail of an asteroid seven million miles from Earth that we have never before seen. Absolutely amazing. Some something for the history books. <clears throat> and, and this is the last frame from the spacecraft before we confirmed loss of signal. I'm joined now by some members from the DART team who have helped turn this incredible first-of-its-kind mission, which honestly sounds like something from a science fiction movie, into science fact. They include Ed Reynolds, DART project manager here at APL, Lena Adams, DART Mission Systems Engineer at APL, Mark Jensenius, DART SmartNav Guidance Engineer at APL, Carolyn Ernst, DART Draco Instrument Scientist at APL, and Julie Bellarose, DART Navigation Lead at APL. At, sorry, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. <laughs> We're going to quickly hear some opening remarks from Ed and Lena, and then we're going to take some questions from our media that we have with us here in the room, both at APL and also dialed into our phone bridge. We're going to try and answer as many questions as we have in the limited amount of time, so let's get started. Ed and Lena, tell us, how are you feeling right now? Great and relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. <So. laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I definitely feel relieved, and uh, it, it is absolutely wonderful to do something this amazing, and we are so excited to be yeah. done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you know, we've worked on this mission for at least seven years now, and uh, it's been a work of over a thousand people that have put their heart and soul into it. So to see it so beautifully concluded today was just uh, an incredible feeling. Right. And also very tiring. <laughs> Again, a huge congratulations to you and the entire DART team. Absolutely amazing history has been made today. We're now going to take a few questions from the media. For folks in the room with us here, if you have a question, please make your way to one of the microphones in the aisles and state your name and affiliation. And for anyone dialed into our phone bridge, please press star one to be entered into the queue. Yes. Hi, Jeff Faust of Space News. Uh, so how close of a bullseye was this? I heard uh, something about 17 meters uh, from the center. Uh, do you have an idea of just how close you got to hitting the, the, the target? That's right. We were about 17 meters uh, getting really close in, and we'll get a much better understanding of where we are uh, from the impact images that the investigation team now is going to analyze for quite some time. Mark? <laughs> yes, so 17 meters was the final estimate out of our onboard guidance. Um, that is to the center of uh, the lit up pixels. So there may be a refinement on that still as the investigation team takes a look at things. Yeah, because you saw the asteroid was not completely lit from all the sides. So actually finding where that center is is going to take some time. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Joel Achenbach with the Washington Post. First of all, congratulations. A tremendous mission. When did you know you were going to hit it? And, um, like, how? At what point during the, the approach did you know this is this is going to be successful in terms of hitting it, whether it was 17 meters or not? That we're going to hit the asteroid. So, I'm going to take the first part, and then um, you can add more detail. But uh, the thing, you know, as as we approached, you know, even when we were like an hour or 50 minutes out, it, it really looked like a nominal, um, a, a nominal ex, you know, trajectory that we practiced over and over and over again. And we practiced all types of different geometries and scenarios. And th this was like I kept telling the people right next to me, this is, this is nominal. This is nominal. This is nominal. So, and it just stayed nominal. So. You know, like 40 minutes out, you were really getting the good feeling. And you could tell everybody in the whole room was getting that same feeling, that it, it, was, it was actually a fairly relaxed environment. It wasn't tense. And then as, as we hit, like, the last two minutes where we could no longer command the spacecraft and you knew we were on the trajectory and you knew that we were not going to do anything to change it, it was just joy <laughs> you know just yeah. you got to enjoy the moment yeah absolutely the the one thing we definitely i just want to say thank you to the jpl navigation yeah. team yeah. because they put us on this perfect trajectory to didymos so the way this mission worked is that we were guiding towards didymos for a while and then we switched over and started guiding towards the amorphous so uh the jpl team actually uh did a lot of analysis recently we executed late maneuvers and were able to put us in the trajectory that basically was hitting bullseye on didymos and that is why the whole team felt so comfortable most of the time that we actually were going to impact and impact well. You're very welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say that uh, once we got a look at Dimorphos, uh, I think that's when the team was confident uh, that we were going to hit. That was the one unknown going in yes, what absolutely. that asteroid looked like. And once we knew what it looked like, we were very confident in the spacecraft's uh, ability to hit it. Yes, absolutely. That was definitely the defining moment where we were like, oh, yes, A, Dimorphos exists. Yes. <laughs> so that was a big relief for everyone. And then, of course, the second part was that we're seeing where we're expecting it to see. It was separating away from the larger asteroid as, as we expected. And then we were able to hit, execute a textbook maneuver. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Hello, thank you. Uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com, I think, for Elena or whomever would like to do it. You mentioned, uh, or Ed described the feeling as absolute joy. And I'm just curious, I mean, there were a lot of celebrations that we saw actually here. There was screaming and chanting just all the way down. Uh, I'm just curious, of those last minutes, five minutes in, where you were all hands off, what that atmosphere was like, and then what Dimorphos 
your first thoughts about seeing it up close with those boulders and crags and, and shadows uh, is like. Thank you. So I'll say a couple of words and then I'll give it over to the rest of the team, especially to Carolyn, to talk more about the surface of the <laughs> Dimorphos. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but um, definitely, as we were getting close to the asteroid, there was a lot of, Ed said joy, I say both terror and joy at the same time, because we, we saw that we were going to impact. We this asteroid was coming into the field of view for the first time. We really had no idea what to expect. We didn't really know the shape of the asteroid, but we knew we were going to hit. So I think all of us were kind of holding our breaths. I'm kind of surprised none of us passed out, actually, <laughs> for a second there. But, um, but at the end, you know, I mean, me personally, I felt a little numb. Like, yes, we were celebrating. There was a lot of joy, but you also feel a little numb that all of this, you know, so much so many years of work are right. now complete. Yeah. And so that expectation of what's next is, uh, but there's a lot of next things going on for DART, so I'll let you guys talk about that. Yeah, I was going to say that these guys, their job is done, but ours is just beginning. So I've been lucky enough to be kind of embedded with the engineering team and watching them all here plan and test and work together. And Draco, of course, was built here at APL. So seeing it come from plans all the way to something that took such amazing pictures was awesome. These guys were all standing up in those last two minutes because they were hands off and looking. And I was like this far from my screen looking at the amazing pictures come in because they were just outstanding. Um, and I saw them come in at the same time as everybody here saw them come in. So, you know, we will spend the next months and years doing analysis, of course. Um, our job has just started, but it really looks just amazing. It looks, it's like adorable. It's this little moon. It's so cute. Um, it looks in a lot of ways like some of the other small asteroids we've seen. You know, if you remember, we've seen Bennu and Ryugu recently through NASA and Japanese Space Agency missions, and they are also covered in boulders. So we suspect it is likely to be a rubble pile, kind of loosely consolidated. Um, Didymos, which you saw leaving the frame, I almost wanted to watch it more. You know, yeah. obviously we want to hit, but I was like, oh, look at that, so cool. It has maybe craters and boulders and smooth patches. And so there's a lot of work that the um, proxim proximity working group will be doing over the next few days. Um, we will be finding the exact impact site to really understand, you know, what kind of crater did we make? Um, and of course, the, the ground-based observers are busy as we speak, you know, looking at the data and taking it over the course of the next um, days and weeks to find out what we really did. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Yes. Hi, Kristen Fisher with CNN. Um, Elena, I was wondering one more time if you could just explain exactly uh, how long it will take before we know if DART was successful in pushing this asteroid off its current orbit. Uh, we know the impact was successful tonight. Congratulations. But you. if you can just walk us through the timing of that second piece one more time. And finally, uh, I'd also like to know if you think that all Earthlings should rest a little easier <laughs> tonight. Thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. Thank you for that question. So uh, we are going to be seeing additional uh, data over the next. So of course, the ground-based observatories are already taking data right now. They are looking at the ejecta. Of course, the JWST and all these other missions are really concentrating on, um, on Didymos and Dimorphos. But what we're going to be seeing probably in the next couple of months, we're actually going to get a confirmation of exact uh, period change that we made. So it's not going to be tomorrow, I'm sorry. But it is going, we might see some uh, leachy cube CubeSat images coming up in the next day or two, which was the little CubeSat that we let go of about 15 days ago. It, it should have flown by by now and uh, took some images of the plume that we created. So we're going to be seeing that data come down soon in the next couple of days. And then over the next two months, we're going to see more information from the investigation team on what period change did we actually make. Because that's our number two goal. Number one was hit the asteroid, which we've done. But now number two is really measure that period change and characterize how much ejecta uh, we actually put out. And I can't remember the second question. Uh, so just to clarify, you say about two months before yeah, we Yeah, about know, two months. Roughly right? two months. My second question was for just real should... For the real answer. Oh, sorry, what was that? I would say a couple of months for the full quantitative answer. A couple you know, of months. Some things will likely come out in even days, maybe weeks, to say this is what such and such a observatory saw or this is what Leech Cube saw. I know that they plan to download images the next couple of days. So we'll get some pieces of that answer soon, but the, I would say the, the quantitative full answer a couple months. 
thing. And then, Elena, my uh, yeah, second the question sleeping was, better question. Should, yeah. all earthlings, should all earthlings sleep a little easier tonight? I definitely think that as far as we can tell, our first planetary defense test was a success, and I think we can clap to that, everyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? So, yeah, well, I, um, yeah, I think the Earthlings should sleep better. Definitely, I will. Yeah. And how do you feel? Like, the people working here, yeah. we're definitely going to sleep better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, next question. Uh, Ken Chang, New York Times. Um, did anything go wrong tonight? I was just wondering, did you have to make any adjustments during the last four hours? No. We have not. No. <laughs> it's just the, been wonderful. This, this mission was straight down the middle of what our expectations were, and uh, there were no adjustments needed. No. Zero. I, it was actually kind of disappointing. We prepared <laughs> these 21 contingencies, and then we did none of them. But, but we were ready to do them. You we, plan them so you don't have exactly, to use them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I'm Marina Korn with The Atlantic. Now that you have gotten a good-ish look at the surface of this asteroid, can you tell us in more detail what exactly happened to the spacecraft beyond it was smashed to bits? Like, in graphic <laughs> detail, like, where are some of the bits and pieces? Are they kind of floating off in space? Are they embedded in this they new crater? If you could hover over the asteroid right now, what would you be seeing? Thank you. Oh my goodness, that's a good question. Uh, I'll let Carolyn take oh, it first. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, if you could hover over it right now, you probably there could even still be ejecta coming out because the gravity of this thing is so low that it actually takes quite a while for things to fall back if they do. So you might still see a cloud of ejecta out there for a while. Yeah. And um, it, we expect a crater of about 10 to 20 meters, right? Yeah. So, uh, so if if this is really a rubble pile, it means that it's pretty low in strength, and that means you will get a lot of ejecta. Um, and that means, you know, the spacecraft is kaput, right? We lost signal at the expected times. That clearly broke. Um, you could find some pieces in the crater. You could find pieces. They'd probably be pretty shattered. You could find debris leaving also. So um, I don't know that you would recognize it. We'll have to see when Hera gets there recognize. in 2026 if there's anything left. But my guess is that was such a fast impact that you won't be able to see anything. And we were also carrying a lot of hydrazine and xenon on board. So we're actually, as engineers, we're discussing in the control room, uh, would we actually see some sort of brightening just based on the fact that we just if, you know, evaporate a whole bunch of xenon, too. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Maya. I'm here with the NASA Social from Cal State Long Beach. I wanted to ask, can you describe like the bittersweet feeling of this DART project that you've been working on for so many years? Like do its job and impact the asteroid but also be destroyed at the same time? I I don't have a bittersweet feeling. Like <laughs> it, we we were given a really hard goal, you know, and you focus on the goal and I don't think any of us named the spacecraft, <laughs> so it, like we we achieved the requirement, we achieved the goal, and that and it and it was a it was you know we did a methodical process to develop the design that could do that, and it's it's to me it's more just satisfaction that the process worked and we achieved the goal and. Um, you know, you always think like, well, if we missed, we, you know, the spacecraft lives and we can do, but it's like, no, we didn't achieve the goal. And so I, I'm, I, I will relish this moment and I am, I am happy with the outcome. Yeah, and I'd like to add that I think the part that we will miss the most as the people who have worked on this for a long period of time is the team. The team we had was right. amazing, and we really enjoyed working as a team together. We had fun. We built a spacecraft during COVID. You know, we bonded over that, and I feel like that made us stronger going forward. So the bittersweet part will really come in with the fact that the whole team is going to be disbanding now, moving on to different projects, and we all hope that we get to work together again at some point. But uh, the point is that the DART team as the engineering team and as management team, I think we're kind of done and we're moving on to other things. I think the other part of that is it, like Ed sort of said, this is the goal. This is what it was supposed to do. So we didn't have years and years of it 
in orbit about something and then it crashed and you remember those good times. Oh, those are great times. You know, the, the good times were right then. We just saw them. <laughs> and, uh, and it was its job. It was supposed to do that to get those good times. So. Yeah. yeah, this was the moment yeah. for the spacecraft. I have to say, I shed a tear. <laughs> when I, you know, the last image that um, didn't come out fully, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of emotion in, in those critical time, and we had some surprises in the last few weeks and a lot of teamwork going on, and so, um, you know, there's a um, lot of um, friendship uh, mm -hmm. that's being built, so uh, it was mm -hmm. a relief to see that it went so well, and from a navigation perspective, it really went very well, and we were, you know, heading straight to... Uh, did a most, and you know we were very happy and relieved that Smart Nav didn't have to do that much until it saw uh, Dimorphos. Um, so there's relief, but then yeah, at the end, it's just I shed a tear, and it's just the emotion that comes up. Thank you. We're ready for the next question. Hi, I'm Brittany Brockington, Upgrade Me BB on TikTok. My question is, how are you going to go about calculating the new orbit or trajectory of Dimorphos? I guess I'll take that one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's all the, the ground-based observing. Um, they've been observing the system for years before now to get a good baseline as to what was the pre-impact situation. And they'll be observing over the next days and weeks and comparing that to what was there before. Um, with, and with light curves. With light curves, yes. So yeah. um, we cannot see the two bodies from the Earth. They just appear almost like a star. It's a point source. But we can tell, uh, much like when you discover an exoplanet, and you can tell that it's there just by the light dimming as it goes in front of the star. Um, it's similar for the Didymos system. So you get eclipses between the main and the moon. And so you're measuring the timing of those eclipses, and that's what tells you how shortened mm -hmm. the orbit got. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Issam Ahmed from AFP. Um, just to piggyback on a colleague's qu question for Carolyn, um, you, you mentioned it looked cute to you. Um, were there any sort of other adjectives that came to mind? What, what would you describe its shape as? For me, it looked like either a, a bread bun or an egg. Uh, what, what sort of thoughts came to your mind? Yeah, every aster is a potato, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, um, yeah, I mean, and it's amazing, right? Um, <laughs> It is awfully egg-shaped, though. It, um, compared to other things that we've seen, that moon looked very, uh, not ellipsoidal quite, but, um, you know, like egg-shaped with a bunch of boulders clearly on the top, like it's a pile of rubble. Um, I was actually a little surprised by the shape of Didymos, too. Um, we had a radar model, which was um, good, and it got the bulk shape. But it actually was more elongated than I thought. And of course, you cannot see details um, with that radar model that we have. And so you could start to see, oh, I think that, oh, that's a boulder. Oh, I can see it. Oh, it's a crater. Oh, my gosh. Is that a smooth patch? That's amazing. So we're going to be able to tell a lot about how the system formed um, and what it has experienced over time um, as we look at these images closer. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we now have a question from one of our reporters dialed in. Hi, yes, these are the questions from the phone bridge. I, I do have two. Uh, the first is from Stephen Clark at Spaceflight Now. Uh, he's looking to know if we have confirmation from Lysia Cube uh, in terms of taking any photos, taking any pictures, and uh, what would be the earliest opportunity uh, for a downlink and seeing those. That's the first question. I'll have one more after that. We're trying to get a pass three hours from now. Okay. Okay. So we did, like, 40 minutes before impact, we, we did get a short email from our, our Italian colleagues, and they were, they were shooting to get a, a, an extended pass about three hours from now, and that would be, that would be the very first opportunity. And so it's, it's just a matter of can the DSN schedule the pass, and can they just coordinate in addition to other telemetry getting the image down. But it is a priority for them. Okay. Great, thank you. One other question from the phone bridge for now. Uh, Jim Siegel with NASA Tech. Uh, the question is that uh, he understands that JPL keeps a sentry risk table of objects, and are there other asteroids or other objects that have already been identified to go after next? So I can jump in here. Yeah, for any questions related to any future planetary defense efforts, please reach out to NASA's Office of Communications for response. Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Gretel Beneschek, and I attended the NASA Social, and I'm a student at Embry-Riddle. My question is, uh, an asteroid hit Mars last Friday, I think, and I, 
I just didn't know if if that was a when we say that's a planet planetary defense, is it just Earth? At this point, I mean, I know it's really In premature our case, to ask it that. Is. <laughs> but okay, that's that's. I just when I when I read that last week, I was like, oh, just yeah. there's there's stuff everywhere. Every planet gets hit. The moon gets hit. Everything out. Asteroids get hit, not just by DART. Um, you know, all the time, and we often use those craters to tell us more about how, what happened in, in history. A lot of that history on Earth is gone. And so we can look at those other planets, you know, the moon and other planets around us to know like what happened in the beginning to get us to where we are now. But, oh my gosh, there's a lot of craters there. <laughs> so a lot of stuff happened, but now not so much. A lot of time has gone by. Um, but in terms of defense, we're the only place with, with life right now, right? So we're, that's what we're really primarily worried about. Yeah, but Planetary Defense Office does actually look at all of these mm -hmm. um, impacts and really assesses what happens. And that's part of the Planetary Defense Office strategy is to characterize you know, other objects in the solar system to uh, and characterize the threat, understand what they're made out of, because, you know, as we mentioned today, if we bring it back to Dimorphos and Didymos, you know, what are they made out of? Did you see that giant rubble pile? You know, what is it actually going to create? Um, and will that impact actually move the asteroid as much as you would expect? And understanding these craters on the moon and Mars really kind of helps you with that. Yeah, and like the whole solar system is the laboratory experiment, and you have to look at all of the data to understand what's happening here. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have time for one more question. Yes. Yeah, hi, David Ariosto, Kanoff Doubleday Publishing. Uh, you had some somewhat new technology on aboard this, this spacecraft as well, the, the solar-powered uh, uh, ion propulsion. And I wanted to know if you could address how that went and also how this relates to, to future missions. Oh, yeah, I, I love to talk about new technology on DART. Number one, our solar panels work beautifully. Um, that was a hair-raising moment for us early on in launch when we had to deploy them autonomously, and that worked wonderfully. They provided us as much power as we expected, and the whole mechanism, deployment mechanism, worked extremely well. And it will be extremely important for future missions to other planets because of the mass savings you get with these rolled-up panels. So uh, we thought the solar panels worked wonderfully. The next sea engine we did demonstrate it in flight for about two hours. We did fire it. It worked as expected. Uh, however, there was a little bit of interaction with the spacecraft as well uh, that was not anticipated. And uh, we have uh, since then not fired the ion thruster. Um, as part of our miscontingency was actually uh, firing it up again. <laughs> but thank goodness we didn't have to do it. Could you elaborate a little bit on how that interacted with the spacecraft? Ed, do you want to talk about Yeah, that? so um, early on in the, the next C development, as we we're developing our interface document, we knew when you start it up, it has a reset mode where there's a little bit of arcing. And the reset mode was understood to introduce up to 25 amps of current that could go through the spacecraft structure. Uh, what was discovered after um, after we launched and after we did this two-hour demonstration, when we were looking at our telemetry, we saw some anomalies in our power system, and we investigated. And it, it led to an investigation using the engineering model of the next C thruster. And lo and behold, we found that there was not one, but two different reset phenomenon that could occur. One was, the second one was rare, and now it's understood, but it, it instead of introducing up to 25 amps, it introduced over 100 amps. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we were, not, we were not tested to demonstrate that we could withstand that. And just from a risk perspective and trying to achieve the, the primary mission, which is tonight hitting the asteroid, we did not want to put that at risk. And so we talked with NASA and came up with a, a recommendation and, and a concurrence to just not fire it anymore. But as Lena had said, if we had missed, um, we, if we had a missed approach um, and the spacecraft was healthy, the, one of the options was we could have fired up, you know, our whole risk posture has changed. If, if you missed it on approach, your risk posture changes. We could have fired it up, taken the risk of, of, of and the, you know, coming over those couple, you know, that 100 amps phenomenon again, and we would have fired it for about eight days, 
and that would put us on a on a trajectory that we would be coming back to the exact same asteroid uh, two years later. Mm. Yeah. And I'll just add that uh, even in the future for next sea missions, um, we don't see a problem with that. This could be accommodated. It was just something that was not not anticipated at the time uh, when we put the thruster right. onto the spacecraft. But ionized propulsion. Yeah, but I'm ion propulsion is extremely great for, especially if you want to go visit all these other asteroids, right? You can actually maneuver around them and, uh, yeah, so we're really looking forward yeah, to it. The thruster, the, the ion, the next seat thruster is a fine thruster. It has great performance. It's just making sure that the interface between the thruster and the spacecraft are, are properly, um, properly designed. Thank you so much. You. That is all the time that we have tonight. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you to our media, both with us here in the room and on the phone bridge. And thank you for watching our coverage of DART, the world's first ever test for planetary defense. To stay updated on this incredible first of its kind mission, including to see any images returned by the Italian Space Agency's Lichia Cube satellite, and to learn when we confirm if DART's kinetic impact with its target asteroid has changed that asteroid's motion in space, visit nasa.gov forward slash dart. We're going to leave you now with that instant repay, replay of dart's incredible last images before its terminal approach. Thank you and good night.